Having started his career in journalism, it's no surprise that director Paul Greengrass has often turned to making films about real life events, among them Bloody Sunday, United 93, and Captain Phillips. His latest, 22 July, is a riveting drama that traces the aftermath of Norway's deadliest terrorist attack. 24 hours later, an almost incomprehensible picture emerging tonight from Norway after those two horrific terror attacks. First in downtown Oslo, then at a youth camp. We're getting the first full picture of the horror as authorities piece together what happened, the killer's meticulous planning, and that plan as it unfolded. On July 22, 2011, 77 people were killed when a far-right extremist detonated a car bomb in Oslo before carrying out a mass shooting at a leadership camp for teens. To help Greengrass tell his story, he turned to Oscar-winning editor William Goldenberg. I'm Carolyn Jardina. Welcome to today's Hollywood Reporter Behind the Screen podcast. In this episode, Goldenberg talks with us about his first collaboration with Paul Greengrass and the making of this powerful film. Billy Goldenberg won an Academy Award for editing Argo, the drama set during the Iran hostage crisis, and earned four additional nominations for films including Zero Dark Thirty, Sea Biscuit, The Insider, and The Imitation Game. Welcome, Billy. Thanks. Thanks for having me. You and Paul both gravitate toward making films about, broadly speaking, dramatic historical events. Is that something that helped bring you together for this film? Yeah, it was for me. Well, he's a filmmaker that I've always wanted to work with. I really admire the style in which he shoots, and uh, I'm really attracted to that sort of first-person, live-camera, verite sort of feel as a, as a filmmaking style. So it was the combination of, of him as a filmmaker plus the script I mean, and the subject matter. It was I wasn't planning on working. I was planning on taking a long vacation, and he sent this script, and my wife read it, I read it, and we both agreed it was something I should do. It's very up my alley politically in terms of saying something that's important and I, I'm drawn to films like that. I said to my wife, I want to make a difference in any small way I can. I've tried, so I've tried to choose films that have something important politically to say I can't run for office and I can't, you know, there's someone I can send postcards and do things like that, but I feel like this is my chosen profession and for me to be able to work on films that have a message that's important to me is something I, you know, I look for films like that. So when this script came and it has so many important things to say about the rise of the alt-right, about gun control, about, you know, violence against children and teenagers, and, you know, so many different things. Um, the combination of Paul as a filmmaker and and then this particular subject. So I decided to go away and take myself away from my family for a better part of seven months. It's a difficult subject, but the film is absolutely riveting. It's a really difficult subject, and I and I was thinking about it on the way here. It, it really did take a toll on me, especially while I was in Norway, because they were shooting, obviously, not on the island where it happened, but it looked certainly looked a lot like it, and, and watching the events unfold and being there and, and meeting the people who lived there, it really, I didn't realize how much of a toll it took on me until only recently. You were in Norway mm -hmm. while they were shooting there, and you had a mostly Norwegian cast and crew. Yeah, I think Paul, myself, the first AD, and the producer were the only Brits and Americans. Did you talk with the cast and crew about the events, and did that influence your work? I didn't talk to the cast and crew that much. I was mostly editing. You know, I was, it was Paul shoots a tremendous volume of film, and I, we had a very short schedule. I think the, the post-production schedule was about 12 or 13 weeks total, which is about half of what I'm used to. So I was pretty careful about, you know, staying up to the camera, getting things cut, and, you know, making sure that, that we didn't use up a big part of the post-production schedule by me still first cutting. But I did talk to people, you know, where I was staying, people that know part of the crew I had was Norwegian, and I did speak to, you know, people who just lived in Oslo, and and Paul, too. I mean, Paul was, even though he's British, I mean, he did a tremendous amount of research and spoke to a lot of survivors, especially in particular the Hansen family. So Paul and I got together every night in the hotel we were staying at and spoke about that day shooting, the next day shooting, what 
the intentions of the film were. This, you know, the this through lines of each individual character story. So I felt really immersed in in the subject. You know, even though I didn't spend a lot of time on set, still it was really valuable to be there, just to be in the environment. And we stay. It was a five minute walk from my hotel to the government building where that they blew up so and it's still there damaged from from the attack so it, it really did give you that's as i was like saying earlier it really makes you feel something that you wouldn't probably feel as much if i mean if i'd stayed here in the states it's told in three acts and it starts with the actual attack and then it becomes more more intimate. Let's talk about each of those. So first, the attack itself. You had a lot of cross-cutting between the events, the families trying to reach their teenagers, what was happening, you know, in the government building. Could you talk a little about cutting that sequence? It was the most challenging part of the film editorially. I mean, not only because it's just a challenging thing to cut all that cross cutting keeping all those stories alive and when to be where and keeping the audience rooted and you know all that just sort of regular <laughs> challenge that comes with a cross cutting sequence like that but it also was a sequence that took a really long time to shoot they shot it mostly for the first two weeks and then kept going back to that it was a place called Hook Island where they actually shot so it was really hard to get a sense of the overall sequence and the pacing of it and the structure of it because I was constantly needing pieces here and needing pieces there because we shot the film, although the event took place in July, obviously. We shot it starting in November in Norway and finishing in Norway around just before Christmas. So we didn't have very much light during the day. And, and the way it works there is every day we lost six minutes of light. So after a month or so, they, it was only light from around 9.30 to 3.30. So they, you know, those are very short shooting days and it's all available light outside. So they had to constantly through the course of the shooting go back and pick up things and go back and pick up things. And, and it got to the point where they couldn't even really get all the material that they needed. There was a whole sequence in the island that took place with Villiard's brother, Toria, who tries to get away by swimming out into the water and being picked up by a passenger, like a, you know, a yacht that or a small boat that some of the locals had across the way from the island. And Bravik shoots at him, and he gets pulled into a boat, and, and by the time, they just never could shoot it because of the weather and because they couldn't put that poor little boy into the water <laughs> because it was just too cold. So we had to come up with editorial solutions to, to sort of get around that part of the the story and it actually served it ended up serving the sequence well in that we really do follow Villar and and the f it focuses on him and his situation so once Villar is injured we decided that the best route story wise was to stick with him and this uh, and the will the police get there in time to save him will his parents find out what happened to him and make that a more of a cliffhanger, and it sort of suited the idea of Villiar being a representation of the people of Norway and their injury, which coincides sort of with his injury. And, and so it ended up being really fortuitous in terms of we didn't have the material, but it made it actually in turn made the sequence better. And then there was a lot of challenges about intercutting when the world finds out in the original script. You're on the island until Villiar gets, gets injured. We ended up moving all that up earlier and to make it more intercut than it would have been. And it really served the attention and served the, and the reality of the situation because, you know, the kids have cell phones and they all called their parents as soon as the shooting started. And the, the outside world in Oslo and surrounding areas in Norway, they all knew about it right away. Villiar really did call his mother from the cliff like that and told her what was happening. So we just took it that once that happened, then the world comes in, the police and some of the parents. And I mean, there were even in real in the real story, there were even, you know, government you know, members of the, of the government that were getting texts while the whole thing was going on in the bunker with uh, the prime minister. They were getting texts from kids on the island. So it in turn made those decisions about where to intercut ended up making the story much more tense and realistic than it would have been. So it was just a really challenging sequence. It didn't really come together 
until halfway through the post-production period, which is for me. Uh, you know, I like to have things done and have things in a, in a shape that feels like a real movie right away. But I just had to be patient and keep working it and working it, knowing that, you know, one day I would have the solution to all these problems. Well, I have to say on a personal note, I mean, I, I lived in New York in 2001. And what I remember about 9-11 is that day you, you really didn't know what was going on. Everybody was trying to reach each other and you didn't have information. It was more, you know, it was sudden, it was confusing. And I thought that the way you edited it really captured that confusion. There were things that we cut out to make it more that way. I mean, they, you know, it was a little, uh, there were things with the prime minister, the family that were a little too more informative and it was felt like it was leading the audience and that you would be sort of guessing as to what goes on and getting little bits, bits of information. You see when things even happen when you're, when tragedies happen and you're hearing them on the news, you know, you're getting bits of information initially that oftentimes turn out to be wrong and, you know, you don't really know what's going on. It takes, you know, several hours for things to, to piece together. So it felt like that was more accurate to what a situation like that would really be. Now, were you working with a team that you've worked with before? Netflix was gracious enough to let me bring two people with me to Norway and London because we did the post-production in London. When I asked, I was surprised they said yes, and I think they understood we had a very short post-production schedule and that if I had my team with me, that things would go more smoothly. I mean, they're very smart. John Weisman at Netflix made it accommodated us and, and let me bring Peter Dudgeon and my first assistant and June Kim, my second assistant. And then we had a Norwegian second assistant, another second assistant who was Norwegian who was terrific, named Geir, and a production assistant. It's always valuable to have a local as a production assistant named Daniel, who made up the rest of my Norwegian crew. And that was, you know, they knew how things worked there, so it really made my life a lot easier. And then when we got to London, we didn't bring the Norwegian people with us, but we picked up some London assistants, Pani Scott and Holly Byrne, who worked with us in London. I think everybody on the film had the same mindset and the same, we were on the ride with Paul because we believed so much in his vision and his the story he was trying to tell. I think it never really felt like a job. It felt like we were doing something important, I mean, in terms of what we were aspiring to. And they were just a really, really great group of people that we had. And so it, was, it made my, the better my crew is, the easier my job is. And, and uh, this was Peter's first time as my first assistant. So it was very challenging to be in foreign countries. And they just all did a spectacular job. And what was it like working with Paul? Does he come into the editing room every day? or No, he doesn't, actually. He likes to keep perspective. I mean, he... You know, in constant communication, and I and at the beginning when I was in Oslo, I was thinking, well, uh, he's not coming to the cutting room that much. I mean, why am I here, really? And then and then I realized I was there for a way different reason. I mean, we spoke five times a day on the phone from the set, and we were staying at the same hotel. So every single night we got together in the hotel lobby and talked about what he had shot that day, what he was shooting the next day. He does a lot of rewriting while he's shooting so he would constantly be sending me pages and he and his development person Emily we would talk either at, at, late at night or in the morning and say like and give Paul feedback on the pages they were about to shoot I think he likes to keep things very spontaneous so he would be constantly tweaking the screenplay and then handing the actors pages in the morning which is a real challenge and so we were able to comment on that so it was incredibly collaborative I mean it took me a little time to get used to it, that a director would be calling me from the set and saying, I'm about to shoot this scene where, you know, Torrier finds out that Villiard's on a snowmobile. I'm going to put the camera here and run it up there. What do you think? And, I'm, and I, it doesn't usually happen. And, and, and then I was so excited that he, that he included me on those, in those conversations. It was really, really fun and, and, and really rewarding to have somebody who would collaborate like that. And then so he, we saw each other every day, and he, but he was probably only in the editing room like half a dozen times while we were in Norway. And in terms of post-production, he, he came in a fair amount, but he, like I said, likes to work on bits and not like look at whole reels and look at whole long stretches until he screens the film. He really is careful about keeping his objectivity. I mean, some directors sit there all day long, and which is totally fine. I mean, that's I mean, however a director wants to work, that's what I'll do. But he you know, left me alone a lot, which was scary but fun. And, and you feel like you're giving, somebody's really giving you their trust. And, and it makes you feel really good as a, as a, you know, as a creative person to feel like that, you know, you're, the director has that kind of faith in you. 
it really was, you know, one of the best experiences I've had. And I've worked with some phenomenal people that I love. So that's saying something. So let's talk about the second act. You're talking about the hospital and, you know, yeah, I mean, it's real. Those, again, were very emotional. I mean, Jonas, who plays um, Villiers, was so wonderful in terms of his going through the initial stages of recovery and even just waking up in the hospital was such an emotional scene to cut because even though I get, you know, it's that thing where in editing where you have to, you know, I think the audience knows he's going to survive because you can see the way the movie's going, but you have to make the audience feel like, well, maybe he's not. And it's that feeling in, you know, in a lot of movies where the audience may know what the event, how the event's going to unfold, but you have to keep them on the edge of their seats anyway. So that was a challenge, finding the right level of, of how dire to make it. And you don't want to we tried very hard to be respectful and restrained and not manipulative, so we didn't want to do anything editorially that was like could be considered trickery to make the audience think, oh, he's definitely going to die, and he's you know, and then he lives. So we wanted to make it suspenseful and emotional, but not make it fake, you know, to make it re- keep it real. So the actors who play Villiers' parents were so strong. I mean, both of them, especially the woman who plays his mom that it just, you know, so much of the heavy lifting is done, for you know, in terms of the editing by the actors. And it's just me getting out of the way and letting those performances breathe. And they just always felt, the four of them always felt like a family. They feel like they really belong together. And, and you really feel her emotions of being a mother going through that situation. I think it really, um, you know, you just look for those moments of reality, of like what it's like to be a parent in that situation and, and use those moments. The performances were extraordinary, I thought. Did Paul do a lot of takes? How much material did you have to work with? Yes. Well, I mean, calling them takes is probably, I don't know what you call them, but Paul shoots a very verite style. The camera's very alive all the time. No one take, you know, you'll get a setup where there'll be five takes, and normally that would be five takes of the close-up or five takes of the medium shot. With Paul, generally it's five takes, and every one is different from every other one. So... Consequently, you get a lot of different material. It's some sometimes with directors, you get a lot of footage, but it's ten takes of the close-up, ten takes of the medium shot, ten. So you get a, there's a sameness of of coverage. Where with Paul and the way he likes to work, it's probably, I guess more like shooting a documentary. He, you know, the cameras just feel it. You know, they 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 shoot one side of a room and and they just kind of rove around and get stuff and. There's a method to it, but it seems beautifully arbitrary. So, yes, I mean, he shot a, a lot of film or digital, you know, material. And it was not just a lot. It was a lot of different angles and kind of untraditional coverage that makes the editing process more challenging, but ultimately more rewarding. You were really able to shape the performances of the characters? Not just the performances, but the moments when you get material like that for me as an editor, it's I find it much easier to make moments where maybe they weren't there or make mo- you know make things out of like whole cloth in a way because when you have traditional coverage, it's more difficult. When you have sort of uh, more unusual coverage like Paul shoots, I, fi- I don't know, I just find that there's always a way to do something. There's always a way to make a moment out of something that maybe or strengthen a moment that really maybe wasn't strong enough. I find it with that kind of material easier to do because you get so many different options. And what were the challenges to editing the conclusion in the courtroom? You know, there were multiple challenges, actually. One of them was just to have Villiard's recovery modulated to a point where you felt like he was on a collision course with Brevik, you know, that it was the alt-right versus a free democracy. So having that, those parallels being portrayed by these two individuals. And I didn't want to be overt about that. It's just to be something you feel. So it was trying to find the right, the right balance for that. And also, so there were things that needed to fall away to make that story, that make Brevig sort of unflappable in the courtroom, so that when he gets to the point where Villiar testifies, that Villiar is the one who takes him down. And that sounds very simple and basic, but it was trying to do that and still keep it a multi-layered, complicated story because you didn't want to make it sort of very, very simple. But at the same time, you want to have that underlying feeling of 
these two were on a collision course. And because there, there were many survivors who testified, not just Laura and Villiard, but that's, that's what our story focuses on. So it was that, and it was keeping sort of the logistics of it straight, like the insanity plea, him changing his plea and all that, and making it very clear. And we went back and did some judicious reshooting of moments to make that a little clearer. I mean, Paul is so smart about story and putting himself in the shoes of the audience uh, and understanding what they might understand and what they don't. And he's really, really smart about that. And it was I was constantly amazed by how right on the money he was about his, his instincts are always so sharp and so right on about what even if it's a small story beat that's not working right, he he just really understands, and it's it's a real important skill for a director. And he's just you know incredibly smart. I can't say enough about you know the co- collaborating with him is just one of the real joys of my career. When VR testifies, you stayed on on his performance mm-hmm. for a, quite a long time. What informed your decisions as to when do you stay on his performance versus when you cut away? That particular idea was, I mean, there was a time where we considered it was all it was in the screenwriting stages because, I mean, I didn't even really even know Paul and he called me and he was in obviously in London and then called me in the U.S. and we t- started talking about the script, you know, like we had been working together for years and it was a little bit weird because I we had instantly hit it off and started talking about really deep parts of filmmaking and the script and, and the story in a way that usually would be something I would, you know, after I've been with a director for a couple of pictures. But there was a talk about, after I read the draft that we ended up actually shooting, he had an idea of maybe doing a lot of the attack sequence and flashbacks. And I felt like there was very good reasons for not doing it that way, because I felt like you really needed, the audience really needed to experience what that was like. And then have the emotional part of the movie, I mean, having the sort of emotionally rooted part of the story, the third act, and even the second act, be sort of more real and without those flashbacks, because it felt like, you know, Villar is a real hero with his brother, and you would lose that feeling of seeing him objectively do that, as opposed to seeing it in a flashback where you say, oh, look, I was a hero, you know, so, and, and because Paul talked about maybe it would be better in the courtroom so we're not in the courtroom for so long to do it as flashbacks to break that up and I, and my I said oh my god that's the thing that I'm looking forward to the most is cutting that courtroom scene and holding on those performances and really being with those actors and and being with with really our character and feeling all the emotion he's he's feeling in a real way and not do any kind of editorial tricks where you're like flashing back and flashing forward and like, and telling a story. I mean, it's incredibly successfully done in The Accused where you don't see Jodie Foster being attacked until that courtroom sequence. But I just felt like from the very beginning, I had this idea in my head that, that Villiard's testimony needed to be in long hell takes to really experience what that was like. And, and I'd seen his audition tape and I saw how strong he was. And so I you know, that was something I planned from before any anything was shot, so. He's completely alone. And he's going to rot there in prison, whereas I, I survived. And I choose to live. What do you hope viewers will take away from this film? I mean, the biggest, the biggest thing I hope people take away from this is how important it is that people recognize what's happening around the world and you know that with in terms of the alt-right and the neo-nazis i mean it's not like right wing or left wing i mean everybody has their own point of view but as people who who sort of promote this sort of violent you know nationalist attitude uh, where they want to cleanse the country their countries of of any kind of anybody who's different than them and that's why I think we all worked on the film. I think mean, we all felt like we were on all for the ride with Paul to, to get that message out that this is a big problem in the world right now, and, and this is a big problem in this country, a big problem in Europe, and, and all over the rest of the world. So, you know, we wanted to tell that story, and the best way to, for me to tell a story like that is to do it from the inside out, so not just, like, talk about a very preachy sort of, like, you know, bang on the table, sort of, you need to recognize this is what's happening. But uh, in this particular film, I feel like we tell it from the inside out. We tell it through Villiard's experience. So I I think it's really important to recognize that. And and so I'm hoping that people take that, you know, that's what people walk away from the film with. And, 
enjoy seeing the film and going through Villiers and his family's experience and and getting you know an emotional hit about that and, and understanding the toll it takes on real people. And then again, like while we were cutting the film, I think it was uh, it, it, Parkland happened. So then it became, you know, I started thinking about guns and teenagers and what happened in Parkland. So I feel like on many different levels this has a lot to say, but I feel like it says it in a way that's not preachy and, and doesn't tell you this is what you should feel or this is how you should think. I think it allows for the audience to come to their own conclusions, but I think it's a pretty strong message. 22 July is now available on Netflix. Billy, thank you so much for coming in and joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.